pass this over to uh, Asim Qureshi and uh, you have 20 minutes. Assalamu alaikum and uh, hello everybody. Thank you for coming this evening. So, I mean, many of you will be familiar with uh, a number of the debates that have been going on around Prevent. It's been quite difficult to ignore it. Um, on either side of the debate, there have been uh, a large scale of discussion, especially around good and bad cases, right? So, for example, um, the government will come out and say, well, we need Prevent because girls are going to Syria. Uh, they're leaving their families, so on and so forth, and so we need to intervene and we need to prevent you know, them from being able to do this going into the future. That's why prevent is needed. And on the other side, organizations like CAGE, um, the Islamic Human Rights Commission, Prevent Watch, others will come out and say, well, we've got cases of nine-year-old children who are being taken out of the classroom and being asked about what their opinions on Palestine or the Middle East conflicts are and that's causing them a great deal of consternation, or children are being taken away from their families based on the need to prevent, where there's very little or dubious evidence that there's any kind of inverted commas radicalization taking place. So, you know, at CAGE we felt like this discussion, while it was important, really wasn't going anywhere. Because, you know, one side will say, this is why we need prevent because of X, Y, and Z reason, or cases, and the other side will say, well, there's all these bad cases taking place. You can't really sort out what the problems are there. So we said, okay, let's strip it back, and let's go to the fundamentals. The government says, we know how radicalization works. So our question, when we kind of brainstorm this, well, how do we know? If we're saying we know something, the question is how? What is the empirical evidence that tells us the how uh, of, of radicalization. And that's what we couldn't find. That was what was missing in this whole discussion. Uh, and so we went looking for it. And then actually it wasn't as easy as, it, uh, as this report might make it seem. It took us about two and a half years to really uh, find the how. Uh, because you know, ultimately the government has never presented an argument to say that, well, we went through this entire process, we looked at X, Y, and Z, and we finally came up with this product, and here are all of our findings, and we, you know, we've opened them up, actually, quite the opposite. They would bury references to their study in very obscure places, so actually you wouldn't even know it existed unless to ask the question. And what really convinced us of the need to do this was a joint letter which we were involved with last year that got published in The Independent, where a group of academics, uh, over 300 in the end, came together and they said that, you know, we believe that uh, Prevent is having a chilling effect on academic freedom or freedom of speech and that ultimately it will be, um, you know, kind of counterproductive, uh, especially to British Muslims living in the UK. Now, there was an article that accompanied that joint letter, and in that article, the government said, well, actually, you know, our frontline staff aren't just, uh, you know, told that radicalization takes place. We, we have a complex system of 22 factors that are used to help train them. And that's when we realized, okay, this 22, it's very specific. We need to actually find out where these two twenty where these what these two twenty two factors are and how they came to that conclusion. Because it's not like they said twenty or thirty. Those would be very round numbers. They could have said like, you know, but twenty two was so specific. We we're like, okay, that must exist. So immediately the channel vulnerability assessment framework, which is the one document that really highlights what these twenty two factors are, you know, was very openly publicly available. But once again what was missing is, well, how did you get to the fact that um, feelings of grievance or injustice are a sign of radicalization or a desire for moral political change is a factor or a sign of potential vulnerability to, to radicalization. So they had all of these, you know, kind of vulnerabilities to radicalization, but nowhere in that process did they say, this is how we know this for certain. So once again, we went looking for it and all we found, and it was amazing when we were doing this research, that literally the only reference was in a book by Professor Andrew Silk, and Google Books brings the, the quote up, uh, 
And then you find the quote, you look at the footnote to find out, okay, where did he get this reference to this study called the ERG22 Plus come from? And it comes from a government document. So we thought, okay, fine, let's find this government document. So we literally trawl the web. Uh, I sent one of my colleagues to the British Library to go and ask them if they had a copy. I mean, it's a government document. It must exist somewhere. Only finally to be told when we ring up the National Offenders Management Service that this is classified. It's a matter of national security. It can't be released to the public. Okay, so the study itself is classified. You can't access the original study or its data sets. Okay, and that still is the case now. If you want further proof of that, you can go on to one of the authors of the study, Monica Lloyd's University of Birmingham uh, profile page on a website where in her publications, it lists the study and right at the end of the publication, it says classified. Uh, once again, reaffirming for us that that is indeed still the case. So, so our problem with this whole thing is that, why, why is this important? It's important because last year the government, through the Counterterrorism Act 2015, made prevent and channel associated to prevent statutory. It meant that it became a duty on every single public sector worker to report on those under their charge to prevent if you know, there were signs of radicalization. So what are those signs of radicalization? We've already said that comes from this study. So you made statutory something that hasn't had a large and long statutory process of review. Like if you're gonna put something like that on a statutory level, our, our whole thing was that you should be able to critique it and review it. And yet there was nothing out there that allowed us to do that. And sorry, this is all in way of background to you know, the actual report itself, but I think it's important to, to know how it is that we came across this thing. You know, and ultimately, you know, my, my thanks to our chair, Ibrahim, because Ibrahim set up a Google alert for ERG22+, I mean, like Google for once, right, about something. And a, an academic article that was published in, the, in a very niche journal of the American Psychological Association came up as a hit. You know, and he immediately kind of called me and said, I think I've just found a journal article about the study. So he sent it over to me and that's exactly what it was. It was basically a summary of their study published in a very obscure place. I mean, quite frankly, no one would have ever found this. You know, had Ibrahim, thank you Ibrahim, not uh, uh, set up that Google alert. So, you know, once we got a hold of it, we were able to actually sit down and scrutinize it. And, and my, you know, our initial first reading you know, we read through the whole thing and we said, okay, this seems like it's quite frankly really bad science to us, but we know we're biased. We're already critical of prevent. You know, once you're inside that kind of critique, it's difficult. So we actually approached three different psychologists because this was written by the, the two authors were psychologists themselves. And we said, would you mind looking at this document for us and giving us your impression of what the implications of this document are? you know, whether or not it's good science, is it credible within your industry? And they all, all three of them came back to us and said the same thing. You know, it's quite frankly, quite farcical that these are the conclusions that they've reached. And when we told them about our knowledge that this was now being placed at a statutory level, they were horrified. They said this is an absolute, this is an, it, the whole thing is a complete scandal um, that it's taken place. So then we went through a process of actually critiquing the document in fine detail. And that's what this report represents. It rep represents the efforts that uh, we and colleagues within the academic community, psychologists, kind of cognitively put together um, in order to critique this journal article. It's not the original study. That's not what we're critiquing. We would love to be able to do so. That is our call. Our hope is that the government will at some point soon realize that transparency in these situations is key, will release the original study and allow, forget about us, okay, quite frankly, we're not important in this discussion from the perspective that it's the psychology community. So really our call is for the British Psychological Society, for psychologists uh, to come out to review that study, to review the data sets and tell, you know, communities whether or not this is a valid science and whether or not it should be placed at a statutory level. That is the reasonable thing to do, to do here. So what are, uh, let me just highlight the key concerns that we have over the journal article. That, are, that the theory and the conclusions of the ERG 22 plus 
study are unproven. Uh, the use of factors from the study to introduce the concept of pre-criminalization. Uh, this is a use that extends beyond the original remit of the authors. So, you know, the authors produce their study. Like any scientist, you produce a study. Some studies are good, some studies are bad, so on and so forth. Our problem isn't with the authors as much as it is with the government for implementing their study. Okay, the authors are just their employees. They were employees of the Home Office, of the National Offenders Management Service. They were asked to do a job, they did a job. Now, how that end product is used, that is on the government, okay? And so, if they are saying within their study that our study doesn't have predictive validity, which we'll talk about later, then it's on the government if they then use that to talk about pre-criminalization, that it can actually, um, that prevent operates in the pre-criminal space, which is what they say, ad nauseam. Okay, also what are our key concerns? The non-recognition of political context as being a significant factor within a multitude that result in disenfranchisement. Also that there's no external oversight from the psychology community of the government's ERG study, raising questions of ethics. Um, a lack of credible peer review processes to verify the science that was relied on to validate the assessment tool. And a lack of replicated research supporting the findings of the study a process that should have been a precondition to um, the UK government adopting it at a statutory level. So the government thems themselves, um, in their official channel document, and channel, for those sorry who, who aren't familiar with channel, channel is the document that sets out the government's de-radicalization program or process. Okay, so the channel vulnerability assessment framework gives guidance as to how um, vulnerabilities are assessed and the process then to help those who are found to be vulnerable. So on the starting page of the vulnerability assessment framework, on the title page, it says, this framework is based on the evidence base of the National Offender Management Services ERG 22 plus framework. Okay, so that's not us saying it, that's the government saying it themselves, that their channel policy was based on the evidence base of the ERG 22 plus. That's significant because they're calling it an evidence base. In their perspective, from their view, what they have is evidence of the way that radicalization works. Okay? All of these things are, are important because they might just sound like nuanced arguments, but ultimately they have the effect of you know, kind of giving this view that radicalization is set as a theory, that it is known, that it is a known quantity. And what we're saying is that actually it's not, and that actually it's much more complicated than that, and the government has got it, well, largely wrong in our view, but at least they've got the, the process of their science wrong in the process. So just for those of you, again, who don't know, the 22 factors, I'll, I'll read you the first 13, which are the engagement factors. This is what they say should be kind of looked at by frontline staff, you know, when they're making an assessment of vulnerability. So grievance and injustice. Threat, identity, meaning, and belonging, status, excitement, comradeship, or adventure, dominance and control, uh, susceptibility to indoctrination, political or moral motivation, opportunistic involvement, family and or friends support extremist offending, transitional periods, group influence and control, mental health. I mean, you know, the transitional periods is fu funny, actually, when, in a really bizarre, macabre sort of way, because... I mean, what? Anybody who's going through puberty basically is a transitional period of life, right? So, you know, as soon as you know, kids hit puberty, what are you going to do? Start shopping them to prevent police. But, I mean, it's this kind of, it's the vagueness of the terminology, right? That ultimately all of us are vulnerable at some stage or another. We, we have a loss in our family. It puts us at some kind of vulnerability. You know, we, um, we go into some kind of depression. We're vulnerable in some sort of way, right? But you know, these are normal parts of human behavior, okay? It doesn't mean that you're gonna be on a pathway towards political violence. You know, even if you're flirting with, you know, kind of literature around terrorism and around violence and around conflicts around the world, it doesn't mean that you're on a pathway necessarily. And our issue is that the government hasn't made a case to show that, to prove that, to prove the causation of that, you know? And, and, and this comes back to so much more of what we've seen elsewhere in, in different parts of the world. You know, whether it's, you know, kind of 
black people being accused of killing police officers because they listen to too much rap music or whatever, right? It's that same logic that, that it kind of runs through this whole thing that there is a certain group that with a certain influence will go on, we know, you know, kind of uh, epistemically to do a certain thing, right? But you can't prove that. There's no kind of causal link between the two. Uh, and that is our issue. So let's look at the data sets, right? Because that's really crucial to all of this. What is the data that they used for all of this? So they, uh, you know, we want to ask the questions of how many interviews were, they, were conducted, but key amongst that is how many of them were violent offenders? Remember, what are we trying to prevent here? Prevent is trying to stop, ultimately, acts of political violence, acts of terrorism, taking place, right? So in order to prevent an act of violence, ultimately you need to understand how violence takes place. So when we're looking at data sets, what we would want to know is out of all of the people that you interviewed, how many of them were actual violent offenders? And that's why the journal piece written by the authors, Monica Lloyd and Christopher Dean, is so important. Because in it, they said the ERG had to accommodate those convicted of extremist offences that fell short of extremist violence in line with UK legislation that set the bar lower than other jurisdictions. Okay? What that means is that they weren't just looking at people who had been involved in violence itself. Let's say, for example, Michael Adebalajo, who we know as a matter of fact, you know, killed uh, someone else, right? That you could say is a case, okay? But what about other cases, other plots? You know, where you're just looking at plots, what they're saying actually is no, we, we, we widened it uh, more than that. Because in the UK we have terrorism legislation that allows for convictions of things like Section 57 and Section 58 offences, which are kind of possessing a terrorism publication, for example. So there's no intent of committing an, a violent action here. There's no capability of committing a violent crime. There's just the strict liability offence. And so, for example, if you take the case of someone like Roxana Begum, at her sentencing hearing, this woman is convicted as a terrorist, but her, the judge says in her sentencing hearing that you're not a terrorist, you are a perfectly kind of reasonable member of society, but you're caught with a terrorism publication, and so for that reason I have to um, give you a, a, a jail sentence, right? So these are the types of cases that get caught up in the data sets of the ERG 22 plus. So you're trying to, pr you're trying to uh, put together a series of factors that will help you predict, or at least um, give some indicators of how violent radicalization will take place in the future, and yet your data sets that you're relying on, for the most part, in their words, don't include violent offenders. They include non-violent offenders, people that are considered extremist, or having committed extremist offenses, which, you know, th those of us at CAGE find we come from a, a much more kind of civil liberties background than the government does on these issues. You know, ultimately, you know, we disagree with that. We don't think that these are actual offences. We think they're constructed offences, that really people shouldn't be locked away for what they read um, because you can't keep society safe that way. Also, as part of their um, data, the authors don't mention the risk of response bias uh, at all. So they don't acknowledge those that they interviewed actually giving them answers that... Uh, they knew that the questioners wanted to hear. Okay, so there's no discussion at all within their methodology of operation around this issue. I mean, they, they themselves claim that actually conduct, conducting interviews was really difficult because a lot of the offenders that they wanted to speak to wouldn't speak to them. So they acknowledge that as being a barrier to their, uh, to their gathering of data. They say we had to rely on case notes. Okay, those case notes come from people who are trying to assess whether or not somebody should be released. But you know, me personally, at least two uh, released offenders told me that, oh, when the, this ERG stuff came up, you know, we kind of knew what they wanted to hear, so we tell them what they wanted to know so that, you know, we could get parole early. You know, it's kind of a nonsense system, but you kind of have to play the game a little bit. So it's, you know, kind of, it's strange that they didn't even factor that, this into their equation when they, um, when they wrote their journal piece. Further, um, for me, what one of the most startling moments when I read the journal piece was uh, 
this discussion that they were having about the, the factors of radicalization, how the, they had gone through this process with this advisory committee, and one of the advisors had said to them, you know, you should really think about including political context as uh, an important factor within radicalization. And their exact words are, perhaps it was an omission for us not to include political context. I mean, you know, when the entire critique of prevent, of radicalization theory, of the government's terrorism policy has really centered around the lack of recognition of political context and grievance within the way in which people become disenfranchised. For the authors to kind of, in a, in, in, I would have to say in somewhat of a blasé way, just simply say that, well, it was perhaps an omission for us not to include, include this as a factor, you know, seems really quite uh, disingenuous actually. So, you know, this is important because, you know, so much of, of the way that we are trying to understand about how to protect our communities rests on giving them avenues in relation to the grievances that they feel on a daily basis. For a government policy and strategy not to recognize that as being a major concern, it, it's not something small. You know, it basically says that what you feel, what your communities feel as a grievance base isn't important. It's not relevant to the way in which we think that we should protect society, okay? And, you know, I don't want to be too harsh, but it's difficult not to be. You know, there's, there's a certain arrogance that's built into those assumptions, which, you know, we find problematic. And so, what is the validity of, of this study? Um, you know, it's once again, it's difficult for us to make an accurate assessment of that. You know, I have to keep on coming back to the point that we didn't, we didn't get a chance to critique the actual study itself. I would love to. I'd love to have a go at looking at this. So we're just critiquing the journal. So we're relying on what the authors are saying themselves. And the authors are saying the current lack of demonstrated reliability and validity remains the main limitation of the ERG at this time. I mean, you're, the authors of the report, they're telling us that the main limitation of their own study, of their own tool, is the lack of demonstrated reliability and validity. And yet the government has placed this on a statutory footing. This is problematic, to say the least. I mean, it's unconscionable. I think that is the, 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 really the word that needs to be used here. Because how do you place something at that level? How do you make every single public sector worker in the country responsible for using these factors when you haven't even accepted, when the authors of the tool that you're using haven't accepted that has reached the level of uh, acceptability and re reliability? And then, of course, that leads us on to the most important part of all of this, which is the government's use of it in the pre-criminal space which I've already mentioned. And the authors, almost at the beginning of their journal piece, they say the widespread use of the ERG demonstrates its face, validity, and utility, but it cannot be taken as a substitute for predictive validity. Okay, this is key, ladies and gentlemen. You cannot predict based on these factors. And if you cannot predict based on these factors, what is their use? What is the purpose? of the ERG? What is the purpose of teaching all these doctors and dentists and nurses, you know, about this? You know, my, my, my own wife, actually, she uh, took my sons to the uh, uh, opticians the other day to have their test done. And, you know, the opticians start asking all these questions. And then all of a sudden, the questions turn to, oh, do you have a girlfriend? I have an eight-year-old, OK? And my wife came back home. And later on in the evening, she said, we're, we now have this environment where I can't help but thinking that was led by prevent. Like, why would, why would you ask about health issues, okay, to do with, you know, do you have any disabilities? Do you have any kind of, do you take any pills and whatever else too? Um, and this was an actual form, she said he was filling out, to getting to, do you have a girlfriend? You know, and so there's this environment that's created where, and, you know, by the way, the opticians kind of association, whatever it's called, I've forgotten its name, did issue guidance to all opticians in the country saying, this is how the government is teaching us to spot the signs of potential radicalization. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's this kind of whole bizarre thing where not only 
uh, does this stuff exist? But it finds its way into the real world. And now my wife is like, I really don't want to go back and to that optician again, even though it's like the closest one, it's right on our doorstep, it's easy to get to. Because, you know, it's just like, it felt so weird and it felt so strange and it felt so wrong for him to ask that question, especially of an eight-year-old, you know? So, this stuff isn't just theory, okay? What we've presented here in this report is real world. It has an implication. It has implication on the lives of all of those children who have been taken away from their families. I haven't got, I didn't get a chance to get to that part of the report. Maybe we can bring this up in the discussion. But, you know, children have been taken away from their parents on the basis of the ERG. Okay, there's a whole chapter in here about the legal implications. And the judges themselves are using that radicalization model as being accepted science. In fact, one judge says, you know, terms like extremism and radicalization, you know, they, they scarcely need uh, defining anymore. But it's useful that we have the government through the prevent channel programs defining them for us. And this is how they're defined, which ultimately all comes from the ERG. So thank you for taking the time to listen to me. And uh, hopefully in the discussion, we can bring some more of this, you know, out. Okay, thank you.